grandchild of our uh, immediate past president, Dr. Ganaka Sena Ratna. We have been doing over last one year. Now, today also we are going to talk about a very important topic. This is actually for improve the knowledge and awareness of our budding physicians, budding internists. So without much do, I would like to invite uh, our president, Dr. Kubuduni Jai Singh, uh, to address the forum. Over to you, Dr. Kubuduni. Uh, thank you, Dr. Premari. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone, all my colleagues, uh, our senior registrars, and other doctors to this uh, SLCM Senior Registrar Forum. And uh, I would like to extend a special welcome to our speaker today, Professor Arusha Desanayaka, who actually kindly accepted our invitation and spending his valuable time sharing his expertise on the topic, ethics at the bedside. I think he's the best person to talk on this. He not only talks about ethics, but also practices good ethical principles. We always respect and value his humanity. I must thank uh, uh, Dr. Priyamali, who is actually passionately leading the scene registrar program throughout, and for choosing the today's topic and the best speaker for the topic. And uh, we have conducted many scene registrar forum, as Dr. Priyamali said, and would like to thank Dr. Ganakasena Ratna for establishing this forum to help our the future internists to become more competent uh, clinicians in the future. So while thanking all senior registrars and registrars and other doctors for joining, I invite you to have a great lecture, witness a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumaduni. So I have selected the most suitable person for this topic and uh, uh, very good human being. Um, great clinician is none other than Professor Arosha Disanayaka, our immediate past president of Ceylon College of Physicians and Professor in Medicine, University of Rupuna. So he doesn't need into much introduction. I would like to invite him to talk on ethics at the bedside. Over to you, Dr. Arosha. Yes, unmute your phone. Okay, I hope you can yeah, hear me. Can hear, All yes. right, you can hear yeah, me. Can right. hear okay, me. thank you, Dr. Kumudani Jayasinghe, President SLCM, uh, Dr. Ganaka Sena Ratna, uh, immediate past president of SLCM, and Dr. Priya Mali, who from the SLCM, uh, my long standing colleague from the CCP and the SLC both. Dr. Priya Mali, who is coordinating this uh, very important training program for our registrars, uh, which I think involves training them to both become excellent consultants as well as work very well during their overseas training. Uh, I'm humbled by this invitation from the SLC who have been invited to speak on this very important topic. And my mandate from Dr. Priyama Ali was uh, to make sure that I speak both about passing exams as well as clinical practice in the ward. And I will try to do that. Uh, ethics and communication skills for exams and clinical practice. Okay. Sorry. Okay, right now, looking at this, uh, give me a second, I'm just trying to remove this. Okay, now ethics and communication skills are tested at every exam in your career. In the MBBS, many of you would have been tested in this. Uh, it may be slightly different in different universities, but in Ruhuna where I teach, we have a OSCE station, uh, where we test communication skills and that actually carries two marks out of 100. That's a lot of marks. In the sense, I think that amounts to about 10 correct to true false MCQ. So that's a lot of marks. Then of course, when you go for the MD, the MD exam, uh, not the MD entry exam, but 
the MD proper uh, part two or the MD exam. We have a communication skills scenario where it's a observed patient interaction for which you will get marks as well as examiner will question. Then of course, in the Viva, there is a separate ethics station. Now I'm actually covering the MD also because I think there might be registrars also in the audience so that they will also get an idea about what is in store. Now in the Viva, there is a separate ethics station, but in that ethics station, there is no patient involved. So what you are asked will be uh, some kind of a philosophical analysis of an ethical dilemma. So we'll have to analyze different aspects of an ethical dilemma and talk about it. So there's no patient, but it's an examining interaction. Now, again, these two components will carry about what 12 marks, I think in the MD, which is again, a lot of marks, a lot of marks. Uh, it's about, you know, it might be about three, getting three uh, short cases or something like that, something to that effect. Then of course, uh, many of you who are senior registrars now and even registrars or even junior doctors will one day want to sit this exam called the MRCP, which is the specialist qualifying examination in the UK. The MRCP has a theory and a practical exam and the practical exam is called PACES. And at this moment of time, uh, in what's called the station four, there are five stations. There is one 20 minute communication skills and ethics. You know, they put both together. The MD, it's communication, but there might be some ethics things as well, but there's a separate ethics discussion. But the PACES, it's clear, it's, uh, it's, it's a combination, maybe very often both together, communication skills and ethics station, uh, which is over 20 minutes. Now, as you all may already know, that the PACES structure is changing. There's something called PACES 2023. From 2023, the structure will change. Uh, instead of this, there will be two 10-minute communication skill stations. And here, it will be an observed interaction between the patient and the candidate, but examiners will not be questioning. Uh, and I think, I think these two will be one on based on ethics, ethical dilemma and, and, and another pure communication. I think that's how it will be, but none of us know because we still not had training for the PACES 2023, but that is a very likely scenario. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to show is that there is no escape in terms of exams from communication skills and ethics. It will be tested at everything. Why is it tested at every exam? Because it is critically important. Right, so now we've looked at why we need to learn this from an exam point of view. Let's look at some other aspects of this. Right, uh, we'll, I'll first spend some time looking at communication skills at exams. Communication skills, what may be tested? The first thing about passing an exam is to have an idea as to what are things that are usually tested. So this is, I made a list of a few things. There may be other things which I have forgotten to add. By all means, develop on this list. This is a good working list. One is, of course, uh, you may be requested to speak to a patient to obtain consent for some procedure, maybe, maybe an angiogram, maybe uh, exercise ECG, maybe, uh, maybe even something simple like a lumbar puncture. But anything it could be, or maybe, uh, maybe undergoing some complex you know, uh, procedure like a thoracoscopic procedure, something like that, they can throw and obtaining a consent. Uh, what you must remember is in communication skills, it is not pure communication which is tested. Very often, a knowledge component also comes in. There's no escape from that also. So if you are ex expected to explain a procedure, you have to have some understanding of what is going to happen in the procedure. Uh, if you are going to get consent for, a, shall we say, thoracoscopy or a bronchoscopy, you have to have a fair, you may not need to know how to do a thoracoscopy or a bronchoscopy, but you need to have an idea about what is going to happen. Then only you can obtain valid consent. The second is, of course, uh, you know, mostly in undergraduate exams, we get people to explain the use of a device can be something simple like an insulin pin. Uh, 
you know, how to use that, where to store that, etc. So that that is another aspect which is tested. Then, of course, uh, uh, very one of the very commonly asked ones is breaking bad news. Uh, breaking bad news is for examiner, easy for examiners because examiners don't need to be very creative and uh, they they no, need not be very creative to to come up with a breaking bad news uh, scenario. So that's the easiest scenario that examiners can make, and that so it, it appears quite frequently in in examinations. It may not be uh, it may not be some very serious illness, but it could be some complex, long lasting illness as well. Then, of course, discussing a DNA CPR decision. Do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation decision. Uh, that is. Uh, complex discussion, but that can be asked. You must remember that uh, early early days, we used to call these DNA decisions. Do not, no, we used to call, call these DNR decisions. Do not resuscitate. But what we're trying to say, you know, resuscitation means a lot of things, IV fluids, food, antibiotics, et cetera. So decisions we're talking here are purely with regard to CPR. Are we going to give CPR to a patient? who goes into a cardiorespiratory arrest. So that's a DNA CPR decision, and that's slightly different from a DNR decision. Nowadays, DNR decisions are not taken, but DNA CPR decisions are taken. Then, of course, another uh, scenario which examiners often think of is to have a problem. As, you know, somebody comes into the clinic, uh, with a very high blood sugar, you've given appropriate medicine and he has this problem. Or you might come across a patient who has not taken COVID vaccination, it's a problem. And the patient's now got a respiratory tract infection. So there is a problem and you're expected to solve it. Solve it in the sense that what you are expected to do is to explore the problem, identify why this has happened or identify the underlying cause. And then of course, find a solution to overcome the problem. So that is also one thing which is tested at exams. Then of course, <clears throat> another thing which is coming up quite a lot is explaining a complex illness. Uh, it's very difficult to explain illnesses, what they mean to people who are non-medical, that, that that really tests you. I mean, just think, think about explaining what SLE is to somebody who is not a non-medical person. It can be very, very tricky, very, very difficult. So explaining complex decisions uh, to patients or you know, explaining even bronchiectasis, you know, things like bronchiectasis or, or maybe take something like interstitial lung disease, you know, how difficult it will be to explain. So explaining a complex decision, explaining prognosis of that illness, et cetera, you know, those are also some others. There's another concept called explaining uncertainty, which we hardly do in this country, but can be tested at something like the PSS. Uh, I once did a lecture on this, uh, I think it was at the CCP a couple of years ago, uh, where you know, very often in the world, we don't know what the diagnosis is. We, we have only some vague idea what might be wrong, but why, what exactly is causing the current complicated situation, we don't know. And we are expected to explain to patients and their uh, relations that we are uncertain about what is wrong and that you know we are dealing with what we have, what, what little knowledge we possess and we are going forward. So it's again, it's a difficult conversation because it's much easier if you know exactly what the diagnosis and what's wrong, even if you can't help it. But explaining uncertainty takes a lot of, a lot of training and a lot of skill. Uh, another one which you may be expected to do is to admit a mistake and apologize for a mistake. This again, we hardly ever give this in the MD simply because within the Sri Lankan socio-cultural setup, uh, very often when you, if you admit a mistake and explain and apologize, uh, mistake, uh, it can have terrible consequences such as having your photograph pasted all over social media and maybe, you know, uh, uh, social uh, YouTuber doing an entire program on you. So people are very hesitant 
But nonetheless, that's an important aspect to think about. And that certainly happens in the UK and that certainly will be tested at the PSS exam. So that is called the duty of candor to a patient. C-A-N-D-O-U-R. Candor is your duty to speak the truth and admit the truth, your truthfulness and being very candid and open about where we've gone. So these are the kind of scenarios that you're likely to be tested in an exam. Just to very briefly read the list of obtaining consent, explaining the use of a device, breaking bad news, discussing a DNA CPR decision, exploring a problem to find underlying cause and find a solution, explaining a complex illness, explaining uncertainty, and admitting a mistake and apologizing. Right, okay. Right, in, if indeed you get in a communication process in an exam, uh, I've crystallized it into seven steps. I think if you follow this uh, for any scenario, if you roughly follow these seven steps, that may uh, get you reasonably good marks. Because at the communication skills testing station, the examiner will have a marking grid. And these are roughly the areas that they will award marks for. Now, first thing is, of course, introduction and setting. Uh, setting is where you will sit with the patient, a uh, place where the patient or the relation is comfortable to speak to you, uh, which is free from disturbances, etc. Of course, that will not be happening in an exam, but that will be happening in a real life communication skills scenario. Then of course, in terms of introduction, it would be important to say what your name is and then say what your status is in the ward and then ask the person in front of you name and you know confirm, is it the patient? If it's the patient with the name maybe, but if it's a relative, to find exactly who he is of the relation uh, of the patient. <laughs> now, again, we in, uh, culturally we are not used to telling, introducing to our to people with our names. But in a country like UK, it is expected that you say who you are. I am Dr. Disarnay. I am the consultant. <laughs> in, that is, I think. Uh, you know, in, in our society, people value uh, your status or your job more than who really who you really are. I think that's the reason for that. But nonetheless, we need to get used to because now, when you train yourself, don't train yourself for the MBBS or the MD specifically, but train yourself for all exams and the award, whichever country that you work in, Sri Lanka or overseas. So introduce yourself by name, say who you are, ask the patient what the name is, and confirm that it's a patient, or if it's a relative, then ensure that you confirm that this is so and so. The step, <clears throat> second step is outline the objective of the meeting and obtaining consent for the discussion. Now, you must tell the person, or you know, I am so and so, I would like to discuss with you this morning about this particular aspect of your illness. Are you happy for me to do so? Uh, it might be, uh, say, if it's a breaking bad news, it might be a pathology report that you have to talk about. Or maybe it's it's if it's uh, obtaining a consent, you, you tell the person, you know, I would like to speak to you about the test that we have planned for you, tell you what is going to happen at the test and test. Are you happy to speak now? So, have, have some kind of outline about what is going to happen. Because it is quite possible that, you know, maybe if it's in the ward, your consultant may have already been to the patient and explained everything. And, you know, you sitting down and the patient will say, no, no, you know, the consultant came and told me what is going to happen. So to clear all doubts, just the, the Ramu or the outline of what is going to happen now and obtain permission. That's step two. Third thing, at exams, it is always looked for. And third thing is, of course, it is brilliant practice in the ward also, also to find out what the patient already knows. Now, I will mix this with some singular because that's what we usually use in the ward. So you tell the patient, 
දැනගත්තොත් උපතුමා හරි උපතු මේ හරි දැනට මේ අසනීපය ගැන මොකක්ද දන්නේ කියලා කොත් දන් දැනට කියලා තියෙන්නේ මොකක්ද කියලා කියනවා what has the patient already been told so that you know you can build up on that knowledge then of course fourth step is the one that will carry the highest number of marks and again remember these seven steps you will not have equal marks obviously for introduction you won't have the same marks that you will get for explaining matters but explaining might have more marks maybe 40% of the marks or something but what you explain maybe it's obtaining consent maybe it's explaining a complex illness maybe explaining uncertainty maybe consenting for a procedure maybe a breaking bad news maybe dna cpr decision whatever it is you need to match the health literacy of the patient now that again is a place where you can actually ask the patient at this stage uh, you know what you already know may i also know you know now what kind of job you are doing so he, very often the job will indicate what their literacy is and if they say they are not doing an employment or self employed you could always ask them may i know to what level you have been educated so that you know you are aware of the health literacy of the patient of course you might feel that you know health literacy is low even in some very educated people but keep things simple and then of course you must use non technical language now at this point uh, it is very important because we have a tendency to use very medical jargon and that will be looked upon as being a shock copy by the examiner who is marking i will tell you a little story here i mean i tell a lot of stories when i teach people when i went for my paces exam that was a long time ago uh, i had to speak to a son of a patient who was having uh, i think uh, a subarachnoid hemorrhage and then who was not recovering very well and somewhere in my discussion i mentioned that the patient will be sent to the speech and language therapist uh, to me that looked fairly simple and immediately after the conversation was over the examiner challenged me and said well you you lose used a very very strong technical term you spoke about speech and language therapist do you think the patient son will know who that is and you know etc so he found fault with me and then i immediately accepted because i i had planned this very well the communication skills in the basis and i didn't use a single complex word but that moment i had slipped so i immediately said you know i was very mindful about that i was very careful not to use but that was a mistake i'm sorry about it if i were doing it again i would not use that term so the other thing to learn is if at any time an examiner challenges you don't challenge the examiner back it is always safe to kind of you know admit your mistake even if you feel that it may not be a major mistake just admit your mistake and say i'm sorry about it but you know next time i do it i'll do it differently you know then then the conversation finishes there's nothing that they can do if you say next time i do this so that's again remember that line if you ever challenge them just say i'm sorry yes that was a mistake but next time i do it won't happen so that the examiner cannot penalize you thereafter uh, and then of course simple vocabulary never use complex english words Uh, those who have worked in england will tell you that patients often don't know what urine is and you know people talk about a water work system etc though it looks quite funny to us because uh, the the registrars who come for the exam you know i i am sure premali has also done you know both of us have examined uh, candidates in england english candidates at the pacers as well we are both examined in england as well but even in england the, all the the suddha candidates they will use extremely simple words to explain to their patients and if we use medical terminology that's not going to look good or any big english words like you know fever subsided the fever has come down they don't subside nobody knows what subside means clear the language has to be audible you know we can't i mean sri lankans are generally very polite people they are soft spoken people but it is very important in a communication to be audible and because audibility gives an impression of confidence if somebody is not audible examiner thinks that you are lacking in confidence and also you need to have this quality of being friendly with the patient that you are not some robot who is standing in front of the patient and speaking in robotic language but but somebody who is friendly with the patient friendly means you know that 
that inspires confidence in the patient in you, and that amounts to what's called an empathic communication. Empathic communication. And there is this concept of chunking and checking. Chunking and checking is, uh, if you're going to explain something very long to patient, don't keep on speaking on and on and on, but it is worthwhile once in a way to stop. Maybe after some time you stop and ask, uh, you know, I ex I'm, I'm explaining something long. So can you tell me whether you understood everything I told you so far? Is there anything you want me to clarify? So uh, when, you, when you feel you're talking too much, stop and make sure that the patient, so chunking is you're breaking it up and checking is you know whether the patient has understood. Now, checking doesn't mean asking the patient to repeat what you have been telling you. That can be very intimidating to a patient. Uh, in an exam, that can be disastrous. So don't ask people to repeat what you have said. But you just clarify from them. Did you understand what I said? Is there anything else that I need to tell you? Right? Okay. Then, of course, so that's step four, which takes a lot of marks. So I want you all to think about this. Uh, all these aspects in your communication. This is not just conveying some facts to the patient. But there's a lot around the facts. How you convey is what how we, is what will determine how you get marks. Then step five is once you finish speaking about that, stop and ask: Is there any clarity? Do you need anything clarified about what I told you? What I told you, you know, anything which any clarification about what was already discussed. You must finish that. So finish that, and thereafter, as step six, you can ask. Is there any other concern that you'd like to uh, discuss with me at all? You know, is there anything else which is worried? Now, uh, this is what is traditionally known in communication things as icing the patient. Or you know, ice means ideas, concerns, and expectations. It's very difficult to kind of break it up and ask. But you could always ask. You know, what are your worries or concerns? What what do you what do you want from us? You know, what is your what is your expectation from us? We will try to do whatever we can kind of thing. So icing bit comes at, at step six. And out of the icing bits, the most important is any other conversation now, uh, concerns. Now, uh, Dr. Kumuduni and Dr. Premali, myself, you know, we all examine at the MD as well, this communication or and the MRCP as well. So from an examiner perspective, we teach, now very often we have not real patients, but surrogates. So we teach the surrogates to have about two concerns. So once they, once you finish, unless you ask about any other concerns, they won't tell you. And then the examiners will mark you down saying that you didn't ask for other concerns and you missed those concerns. Those concerns may at times be even absurd. More like, uh, now once I remember we said for the MRCP papers, somebody who's got knee swelling, uh, knee swelling due to an osteoarthritis, but if you, when you ask the patient, the patient's worry was patient's sister has had a DVT in the past and patient was worried that the patient was also having a serious DVT illness. Now, it sounds really absurd to us because here we have some knee joint swelling. But you never, this important thing is you never dismiss the patient's concerns. That is something you must remember. You will always acknowledge the patient's concern. Acknowledge is yes. Now that you tell me that, I understand that you're worried about. That is acknowledging the concern. But may I tell you that, you know, this is something completely different. This has nothing to do with the DVT. So don't worry. You'll be fine. Or if by any chance your communication skills is with somebody whose blood sugar is high because the patient is not taking metformin because somebody is told metformin causes kidney failure, you don't tell the patient, no, no, no. That is a wrong belief. No, you don't. You don't dismiss patient's concern. But you acknowledge what you say is, yes, I do understand that there is a story which is doing rounds that metformin causes kidney failure. But what I want to tell you is metformin has been used for about 50 years now. There is a lot of research doctors have done in this country and overseas, and no one has shown, none of the research has shown that these kidneys are affected. So that is not a correct belief, though, Many people have it. So that's how now, acknowledging a concern doesn't mean accepting what the patient believes, a wrong belief. Now, you don't go and say, yes, yes, kidney failure is caused by informing, but still take metformin. You know, that, that, you know that that's a wrong belief. 
it's not accepting but acknowledging because patients have a right to believe what they want even wrong things are you know, all of us all of us believe in religions and who knows these religions may be right these religions may be wrong we don't know so but we have a perfectly perfect right to believe in a religion right so it's our belief and it is important to us so no one should laugh at our beliefs just the same way patients have a right to believe anything so you will listen to their belief acknowledge their concern and then explain the real situation so that's the icing or any other concerns and finally step 7 will be to conclude a conclusion obviously we say thank you but what is important is to create a follow up opportunity to reflect on the conversation and ask anything more so you tell the patient right okay now i've told a lot of things to you and and you know all of these things maybe having you worried it's okay you go home think about this and i'll be in the ward tomorrow morning you are free to come and speak to me tomorrow morning in the ward then we will discuss further so before you say thank you you create a opportunity create a window for patient to now clarify any other doubts that they may have uh, i mean you don't say silly things like you know i'll give you my telephone number you call me any time of the day you know because we expect doctors to to be realistic i mean nobody gives that telephone number and say you know you you call me any time you want we don't do that but what we do is in a more professional way we will create an opportunity for them to come and see meet us in the ward or clinic or wherever so i want you all to remember these seven steps uh, now you might we are aware of something called the spikes model in breaking bad news if you look at the spikes i mean it follows a similar pattern but my problem with spikes is it has something a step called empathy you know empathy is not a stop empathy step it's empathy is a overarching thing which covers all these things so i think this is a tried and tested method seven steps which will be introducing yourself and the patient outlining the objectives of their concern finding out what the patient already knows explain what the problem is make sure that i know inquire whether there are any other matter you know whether everything that you said is clear then six step is icing the patient or any other concerns and then of course a good strong conclusion where a patient an opportunity is created for the patient so these are the seven steps now i spoke previously about all the things which can be asked in a communication skills thing and then of course for any of these things it is the same seven steps only step four changes from one to one whether is using a device or breaking bad you introduce yourself set the outline ask what the patient already know then comes the change as to you know whether how things change with each one then of course uh, you know clarify what you have said any other concerns and strong conclusion that is common to everything so this seven step structure is common to every communication skill and only number four changes from what you are asked i hope i have made myself clear uh, premalik am i being heard all right yes yes yeah okay right okay uh, and then uh, you must tell me if i am at any time if i am going over time also okay uh, yeah and they are also anyone want to ask a question from you they can unmute themselves and ask i am very happy to answer anybody can i uh, or shall i finish the ethics part also and then ask them no, to, no, that's, uh, ask yeah them. yeah you can continue yeah, that's fine. yeah once yeah. you see to okay. have questions just let them know thank you right okay ethics is my pet hobby uh, Uh, i got interested in medical ethics a long time ago i first attended a course in 2003 as a registrar uh, arranged by professor atula sumati pala and uh, professor sisira siriba at then at that time i'm very grateful to them for kindling this interest in ethics for me and uh, then of course it took uh, you know i as a senior registrar back in 2005 i made a presentation at the young physicians forum at the ccp on ethics at the bedside talking about clinical ethics and actually that uh, i won the vijay rama prize for the young at the young physicians forum back in 2005 so it has been something very uh, dear to me and a message which i have been trying to uh, carry for the past uh, maybe about 20 years but I, i first got really interested in 2003 so it is been about 20 years i have been you know, working on this for about 20 years 
so it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you again for inviting me to talk about my, my very special area of interest in medicine, as well as being able to share with you. Now, ethics, if you look at it, is a branch of philosophy. Ethics is, has, is not medicine, ethics is philosophy. But philosophy which deals with morality. Now, morality is the right and the wrong of, of our actions. So morality is right and the wrong. And then uh, ethics is that branch of philosophy. Philosophy has many branches, but one branch of philosophy is ethics and it deals with morality. Now, medical ethics refers to uh, the dilemmas. Now, ethics always works in a context whenever there is a problem. There is no free-flowing ethics. It's always contextual. Uh, uh, dilemmas related to the duties that we have towards patients and others and our colleagues, etc., and outcomes in medical practice, duties, and also what when we carry out our duties, what the outcomes will be. Now, medical ethics roughly has three areas. Now, why people have all gone away from ethics is uh, all just about every lecture that you hear in ethics is to do with research ethics. And they can be quite boring. I, I myself have done research ethics lectures and they can be quite boring. I, I, I come close to falling asleep when I do research ethics lectures. Uh, and then, of course, you know, many clinicians are not full-time researchers. They have only a passing interest in research. And, you know, so unfortunately, uh, too much talk on research ethics has driven people away from medical ethics. But our real passion is clinical ethics. There is a massive area in called clinical ethics and we'll, we'll speak about some of those today then of course there are professional ethics uh, which is to do with the etiquette or how you conduct yourself as a doctor uh, within the professional community you know so i'm not going to spend too much time on that but let's look at clinical ethics which is which is really our heart and then spend time on research and a little bit on professional as well now, if you look at the General Medical Council, uh, you know, people are really struggling uh, to find the difference between professionalism, ethics, and good medical practice. Good medical practice is probably the best term that we have to have for how we should be in the walls. Ethics is a part of good medical practice, but good medical practice will have other things as well. For example, having clear handwriting is part of good medical practice. Actually, if you look at the GMC, one of the things is clear handwriting, good medical practice. But that's not ethics. So good medical practice is an umbrella term. It carries a lot of things, and ethics is one of them. So a beautiful document is a GMC thing on good medical practice. I suggest that you all have a look at that. There is the Sri Lanka Medical Council good medical practice. Uh, that's not a very uh, sound document uh, that needs to be changed as soon as possible. Right, now I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to what, you know, what classical ethical theories are. Uh, you know, you might wonder why are we talking about this, but you will realize why I'm talking about it. I'll explain it very simply. Uh, ethic, you know, ethics, uh, long before medical ethics came into being, people are talking about ethics for the past so many centuries. There are two major schools of ethical theories. Deontology and utilitarianism. Very simply, deontology is your duty. We, you know, we have a code which says, no, this is right and this is wrong. Deontology is our duty, and it says you do the correct, you do, do the correct thing. Always you correct, do the correct thing, you do the right thing. And then, of course, uh, you know, you, you have a human being in front of you, your patient, and you do the correct thing towards the patient. Utilitarianism is to say, you must not look at the action, you know, whether you are doing the correct thing or wrong thing, but you must look at the outcome. Utilitarian means, you know, world has so many billion people. What is right is what brings about the maximum amount of happiness to the maximum number of people. Very simple. So it says, don't look at the act, but look at the outcome. So deontology looks at the act. It doesn't look at the outcome. Utilitarianism looks at the outcome and not at the act. Now deontology is now, for instance, a crude example is 
if someone was to come to Premali and say, I want to meet Arosha, I want to murder Arosha Disanayaka, where can I find him? Or Premali will not tell lies. So Premali will tell the truth. Arosha Disanayaka can be found at such and such address. You know, that's looking at the action. It's a good example. But and then of course the net result might be I might be dead. You know, that, that's a very kind of you know rough example. But here we are looking at the action. That's the ontology. And then of course, utilitarianism is what the outcome, what the ultimate outcome. Uh, there was two major schools of thoughts were proposed by uh, the great uh, German philosopher Immanuel Kant is the one who said, we must always do the right thing or we must look at our action. Then of course, there were two Scottish and English philosophers, Jeremy Bentham and Stuart John Stuart Mill, who proposed that, no, no, it's not the action which matters, but the outcome. Now, it is from those two that what we call patient-centeredness comes. Patient-centeredness is there is a patient in front of you and you do the best for your patient. But what at times the best for your patient may not be the best for the society. Simple example is if there is, shall we say, a commercial sex worker who is with you who is HIV positive and, you know, patient-centered is you will, uh, you will maintain confidential. She says, doctor, you know, don't tell anyone. I can't stop my job also. Uh, I will carry on with my job. So, you know, you, you do the right thing towards the patient, but the society will suffer as a result of that because that patient might be a source of HIV for so many other people. So that's patient-centeredness that can be harmful at times to the society. Then, of course, society-centeredness, that is utilitarianism, where you look at the benefit for the society and not the individual, that may actually be harmful towards individuals. So roughly what happens is clinicians are very patient-centered. We are very duty-based. We are Kantian people. And of course, the public health people are very society-centered. They are fully utilitarian. And then they are with them and me. Now, these theories are nice for people who are interested, but uh, the medical community always had a problem converting these theories into actual principles, which can guide practice. So now we have four principles. All of you know these four principles, autonomy, beneficence, not maleficence, and justice. So when we have a problem, we don't have to go to classical ethical theories. We know, we know how these, uh, we know these principles and we can apply to this. But interesting thing is if you ask people, you know, from where on earth these four principles come, those who even deliver lectures have no idea from where these came. They have no idea about, you know, who said that these are the principles. Well, uh, in 1979, uh, two uh, professors of medical ethics from the Kennedy Institute of Ethics in the USA, they wrote a book called Principles of Biomedical Ethics in 1979. And they crystallized the theories into four principles, these four principles. And then, of course, these their books have been reprinted and edited. There is, uh, even now, there is, I don't know, 12th edition or whatever of the book. I have a couple of editions earlier book. Uh, if anybody with interest, it's a good read. Uh, so this is the book from which all these principles came. So now you know. And then, of course, autonomy is a very kind of a, very limited term. Some people actually uh, talk about respect for persons there and then go on to say uh, autonomy uh, refers not to informed consent and it also covers truth telling and confidentiality. The fact that you're, you're, you're retaining confidentiality and you always tell patients truth. So autonomy is not purely informed consent, but it can include things like truth telling and confidentiality as well. Right. Uh, uh, one slide on auton autonomy, you must know what valid informed consent is. Valid informed consent requires three criteria to be fulfilled. One, the patient has to have capacity to give consent. Capacity means somebody who is maybe a minor. In Sri Lankan law, a minor is up to 18 years. Whether somebody less than 18, shall we say 16, can give valid consent has not been tested in the court of law, but I think it will be accepted because you know that, you all know that legal age for marriage in Sri Lanka is 16. Uh, is is 16, is it? Or oh, whatever. 
uh, anyway, up to 18, Sri Lanka, it is considered minor by law. But if a court case comes one day, we will know from which point onwards the judges will accept that somebody has capacity to consent. That has not been tested so far in a court of law. Also, if somebody lacks mental capacity, like somebody with advanced dementia, somebody who's unconscious, so they don't have the capacity to consent. So or informed valid consent can only be obtained by those who have mental capacity to consent. Now, capacity will include being of the correct age, ability to reserve, receive information, ability to understand and evaluate information, and ability to decide. So all of these will be part of consent. Patient, now if a patient has advanced dementia, they will be able to receive information, but they will not be able to retain and evaluate the information and then decide on that. So that part is missing. So that's the capacity part. Second thing is, even if somebody has capacity, the, the patient has to be given all the correct information. All the relevant information has to be given. And that decision has to be made voluntarily without any kind of coercion or undue influence, which might include actually paying money for something. For instance, if I want to do a research project and I want valid informed consent, one means it has to be somebody with the with correct capacity. They have to be given all the correct information, what harm can come to them, what benefit can come to them. They have to agree voluntarily. I can't take a group of prisoners and you know have the prison guard standing by and making them give consent. So that is not valid. Oh, I can't say I will give you 1,000 rupees if you agree to this. So that's not voluntariness. And wherever a patient lacks capacity, the general principle is the medical professional needs to take a decision with the best interest of the patient in mind. Now, this is the English law. This has not again been tested in Sri Lanka. Uh, there is no law in Sri Lanka to uh, clearly that, uh, to, to state what is right or wrong. So what happens is if it is challenged in a court of law, the judges will go to, if there is no law laid in Sri Lanka, if there is, they look at past court decisions, uh, that those are called precedents. And or they will mostly English law to look at cases in England and decide. So we are generally okay if we always act with the best interest of the patient in mind because English law accepts that as the premise if the patient is unable to give, has, does not have the capacity to consent. Right. Now, just now we spent a fair amount of time earlier about how to how to navigate the communication skill station, seven steps. Now, here is how you are going to navigate through an ethics station. How do you resolve an ethical dilemma? So this is these are the steps you must go. One is identify underlying ethical issues. You know what are the problems here. Second thing is apply the principles to those problems. You know four principles: autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. I have not explained those. I hope I'm sure you might know. If you want, I can spend one minute and explain that as well later. Then, of course. Step three is way outcomes. Now, autonomy, I have already told you what autonomy is. Beneficence is what you do. Now, your, your relationship is with the person in front of you. It's with the patient and not anybody else. So what you must do has to be beneficial to the patient. Non-maleficence is what you do must not be harmful to the patient. Now, if by any chance uh, you, you want to treat somebody with severe sepsis with antibiotics, uh, the benefit is giving antibiotics, but when you put a cannula, patient is going to feel pain. So on one hand, you have a duty for beneficence and non-maleficence. So you have to break non-maleficence because the patient has to undergo pain. But when you look at both those two, you know that the beneficence is far greater than the maleficence. So you will, without even thinking about it, put a cannula and give the IV antibiotics. So you weigh outcomes, that is apply principles and see, you know, how, how do the principles apply to each situation? And we look at a few scenarios then you will understand this better. Then of course, invariably, very often you will find conflicts between principles. What, the action that you 
do may have a beneficial effect and but may have a you know non beneficial effect like non maleficence problem maleficence problem also like a cannula i told you so very often you might find a conflict between beneficence and justice for instance a classic example is this icu bed you know there is there is you have a patient who is marginally unwell you want to put the base you have two patients to put to the icu there is only one icu bed so you know how do you manage an icu bed giving it to the most deserving patient so you have a beneficence duty towards both patients but you will have to choose between them as to the one who deserves it most so it's a justice issue justice is actually if you look at the four principles the first three principles autonomy uh, beneficence and non maleficence they are all to do with kantian not deontological principles your duty towards the patient so that's one side justice is your duty towards the entire society to a large to not just to the patient in front of you but to all the patients in who need that so uh, that is the utilitarianism or the bentham stuart and stuart mill aspect of it the utilitarian aspect comes in in allocation of scarce resources now as a doctor you have to you have all those so beneficence versus justice is a classic example of deontology versus uh, utilitarianism that's why i explained it at that moment then of course very often we might have autonomy versus beneficence patient might say i i don't want this particular treatment when you know very well as the doctor that the patient will benefit from that what do you do or it can be autonomy versus justice you know patient might actually require say doctor i would like to have a, this scan done very quickly and then you know like there might be another patient who needs a scan who has got admitted later but who needs a scan more urgently so you know autonomy versus justice patients patients don't have a right to by autonomy you must remember that patients don't have a right to ask for inappropriate treatment you know you can you can have upper respiratory tract infection go to hospital and ask for icu bed but if it's an appropriate request if they also will benefit from that and then of course Uh, you might have autonomy versus justice conflict so there are lots of ethical conflicts and then how do you resolve this resolve any conflicts remembering our primary obligation is to the patient in front of us that's i am being very selfish here being a clinician i always say our primary obligation is not to the society but to the patient in front of us and we need to do what's best for the patient in front of us but having said that it's not that, that easy <laughs> Now, out of the principles, now for instance, we know that, uh, for instance, uh, if it's uh, autonomy versus beneficence, uh, patient uh, patient will benefit from chemotherapy. Patient says, "I don't, I don't want those treatments, doctor. I have heard that they are awful treatments." So, autonomy versus beneficence, both are for the, your patient. So, when both are for your patient, how do you resolve that? Though all four principles are supposed to be equal. Uh, autonomy is generally considered the first among equals even among equals autonomy is probably the first that's not a rule but that's a general belief i have unashamedly uh, borrowed that phrase from a book by jeffrey archer the great uh, english author he wrote a book called first among equals so i i keep stealing that title from him autonomy is the first among equals if you are in doubt one of the safe things to do is to seek the opinion from an expert uh, you know i'm not an expert but i once remember i had a call from uh, dr satyajit who is now a consultant neurologist in england i think to satyajit who called me and said you know i have this problem so what is your opinion i, I really kind of you know it was really uh, surprising but i realized what he was trying to do he was just trying to get some expert help about the situation where he was in doubt then of course when you take one decision you know that there might be some harm because you are trying to balance the the dilemmas or the principles so you do what's called damage limitation uh, you you if you can't give the first bed to your patient you at least try to get the second bed for your patient so you know damage limitation you try to reduce the amount of harm that might come about due to the decision that you made then of course at times uh, you need to negotiate and look for comprom compromise solutions for example you all might know 
uh, now I spoke to you about autonomy versus uh, benefits and somebody refusing treatment. Uh, you might, uh, it's not it's not one way or the other. You could always say, you know, can I, can, you, you look for halfway solutions, you negotiate and say, you know, can we, can you at least take this treatment? If you don't like chemotherapy, can you at least sit for a radiotherapy session, though that may not be ideal, or can you agree to surgery, which may not be the best, but that may offer some benefit. So you negotiate and look for compromise solutions. It may not be the ideal solution, but some solution you try to come for that. And then of course, final point is, when you're sorting out an ethical uh, dilemma thing, you must remember that law overrides all ethical considerations. So whatever that you feel is ethical, at the end of the day, if it is against the law, then you need to, you need to do what is uh, legally provision, uh, provided, because otherwise you will end up in jail. A classic example I'll tell you, in Sri Lanka, there is no law uh, where doctors can cover themselves on a DNA CPR, or on, not DNA CPR, but shall we say, uh, removing, disconnecting a ventilator. Somebody's ventilated, there is absolutely no law in Sri Lanka. It has not been tested so far in a court of law. So we don't have precedence. And then there was this discussion a couple of years ago. I was on the same panel along with uh, Honorable Justice Yasanta Kodagoda, who is a Supreme Court judge now. He was at that time, I think he was the Solicitor General at the time uh, that we had this symposium. And uh, he, it was very clear. He said, you know, don't even think about disconnecting a ventilator because if there is a court case, you will, you may be found guilty of manslaughter. Manslaughter is just below willful murder. It is quite possible that a doctor who disconnects a ventilator, if it is challenged in court, a judge might hold that you are guilty of manslaughter and you might end up with, with maybe 10 years in jail or something like that. So remember, what if there is no law, we must be very, very cautious about this, uh, about, uh, about DNA CPR decisions. Again, there is no clear law. If your decision is challenged in a court of law, there is a possibility. I'm not saying it is going to happen, but there is a possibility that some judge, you know, who, who thinks differently might find you guilty of manslaughter. And that can be very, very difficult for you. So... Uh, what we must do is to try to have proper legal provisions for these critical matters. But at the base, at that for the time being, one must be very careful about these decisions where there is no law. If there is a law, say for instance, a classic example is now at times you might feel that an abortion is ethical in a particular instance, instance, but abortion is illegal in Sri Lanka. So that's that. You know, though it's ethical, we don't do that because we can end up in jail doing that. So this is how you resolve an ethical dilemma. For any of the senior registrars, for any exam that you go, these are the steps that you go through. Look at the scenario, identify the issues, apply the principles and say, when I apply these principles to these issues, this is what I get. I have conflicting you know, principles. When I put everything together, this I think takes precedence. Maybe autonomy takes precedence. And this is what I would do, but I won't stop there. I'll do everything possible to minimize the damage or limit the damage. I will negotiate with all parties to come up with the with a with a compromise solution. And I will also, if I'm not in doubt, I might ask an expert in ethics committee in Sri Lanka. We don't have clinical ethics committees, unfortunately. We don't have, we have only research ethics committees, but there are people who are interested in ethics, so you could have a chat with them. And then of course, I will also check what the legal status is in this matter and make sure that what I'm proposing is not, is within legal terms of this country, okay? Right, right, okay. Uh, now, uh, to, to summarize all these things, I, I, I'll take you through a few scenarios. Uh, uh, Premali, what is the time? Uh, have I gone over time uh, already? It's almost one hour gone. Um, but we will discuss. That is fine. Huh? Like I think probably 10, 20, 15 minutes, we can do this. Sure. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll look at this. because I, want, I didn't want to rush through because it's. I just want to train you all how to do now the scenarios. Scenario one involves research ethics. Now you're all, every single doctor, must know about the Tuskegee syphilis study. Uh, very briefly, it was a study which was carried from 1932 to 1974. 
conducted by mind you the public health service and the center for disease control in usa who are the top government institutions in usa there was a study which started in 1932 on the natural history of untreated syphilis in american african american patients black americans or what happens to them untreated syphilis patients were never told that you know that they were what was being tested they were told to live normally you know so the black community they would have uh, lived normally in the community they would not be told that this is a sexually transmitted disease that they are having you know they will have sex with other people so the researchers want to see you know what when they have sex with other people how many people actually get syphilis etc and importantly even after effective treatment which is penicillin even after penicillin was identified as effective treatment for syphilis subjects were not given treatment because they wanted to make sure that you know they want to follow them up till they died to see whether they died of tertiary syphilis or whether they died of something else you know what were the complications of tertiary syphilis that they died you know they the researchers wanted to see then of course several people along the way protested against this but uh, american uh, this important public health institution they didn't take notice because you know it a black cover americans nobody cared till of course one of the doctors in desperation like happens in sri lanka he went to a newspaper and the newspaper broke the story all hell broke loose after that at that time ted kennedy john f kennedy's brother was the attorney general i think and then of course he started an inquiry and in resulted uh, there was there everybody i didn't uh, uh, understood what a bad thing has happened there was uh, something a big inquiry and something called the belmont report came that's the first time some principles came out of all the ethical theories first time somebody laid down principles they laid down three principles uh, respect for people beneficence and justice uh, with regard to research ethics they laid those principles uh, belmont report and in 1997 president bill clinton issued the formal national apology on behalf of the nation of america to all the participants and i think uh, as usual america gave 1 million dollars or something for each family but at least there was a formal apology from the president now mind you this happened in the usa so this is how how bad things can be if we look at i'm not going to ask you all to look at the the, the issues which arise here obviously informed consent or autonomy has been utterly violated beneficence has been utterly violated patients were not given treatment non maleficence was utterly violated somebody could say yeah it's good because you know white americans can know what will happen if they don't treatment take treatment for syphilis so that you know they can they will be uh, advised to take treatment in the future so that's why it's wrong with justice that's what's wrong with utilitarianism because it when we go for society's benefit we can actually harm individual people so that's the that's why we are always suspicious of this ethical principle called justice though we have to live with it we must be very mindful of justice based justification second scenario again i'm not going to ask you all to respond because we don't have much time but this is again straight from the ward that I, i will read this 6 year old previously healthy patient was admitted following a tia developed a stroke while in the ward developed a stroke while in the ward she t showed evidence of an ongoing uh, evolving infarction thrombolyzed after explaining risk to the son who was with the patient infarcted area turned hemorrhagic patient's weakness increased never regained full consciousness developed aspiration pneumonia discharged home after treatment of pneumonia in a state where the patient was confined to bed the medical team told the truth that it was the medicine which led to the bleeding complication and it probably made things worse for the patient family was unhappy but said that they can't do anything because they agreed and signed so this is uh, one of the ethical issues you can identify here think about these things think about this play, uh, things now how about you know was it what about beneficence yes when we initially made the decision to thrombolyze the patient we had research evidence to say that the patient would benefit so i think it was a correct decision we did discuss with the family but you must remember families consist of many children and you know one son might agree desperation depends on the information that you give also somebody may have said your father will get up and walk 
once this injection is given, we don't know what was said. But uh, other members in the family were unhappy. So in terms of beneficence, autonomy, I think you know the team was justified. But uh, unfortunately, uh, an unexpected complication came, but it was the ethically correct decision. And then, of course, uh, a very difficult decision came out, the duty of candor to tell the patient that actually the patient wasn't because of the injection that we gave. Now, that is a very difficult thing, but we even in the middle of a lot of difficulty, we actually told the family and the family was obviously not happy, but we, we, went, we went ahead and told them that this is what we think, you know, unfortunately this happens rarely, but it, it happened. Then, of course, you come to the question, should you not have told the truth about the complication? If we had not told the truth, we may have been being unethical because we were not truthful under autonomy. But, of course, you know, the family would have been quite happy with the medical care that they received from us. Family would have been happy about the medical care they would have thought, you know, and maybe the patient also would have been better. Better, we don't know. The patient may have been better or worse. But... We stuck to the duty of candor and we told them the truth because we believed that was the right thing, right thing. If the patient was not told the truth, somebody could argue and say, uh, you know, their, their minds would have been at rest uh, and they would have been happier. But having said that, when you look at the patient in front of you, you look at the four principles and you take what you think is the most correct decision, most ethical decision, because some of the consequences we can't predict. And we feel that we took the correct decision, though there were conflicts in terms of, you know, we, we, we are not going to harm the patient, but a rare side effect came and we harmed the patient. So we, we breached non-maleficence unintentionally. And we tried to create beneficence, which didn't work out. And of course, autonomy patient didn't have capacity to consent, but we took the decision after discussing with the, the family. Third scenario, again, something from the ward. 72-year-old patient with hypertension was admitted to the ward with shortness of breath. Creatinine was six. The diagnosis is heart failure secondary to fluid retention. Uh, doctors feel that he needs dialysis urgently. The patient refuses, saying he does not think that dialysis is going to help. He feels better with injections and wants to go home. He says, you know, I had a couple of injections. I can breathe a little better. You see that the patient is really short of breath and that he wants to go home. So ethical issues that we identify, one is, of course, if we send the patient home, it might cause harm to the patient. So it's we are breaking non-maleficence. We are trying to do good to the patient by dialyzing. Patient will be that much better. We, are, we have a duty of beneficence, but it's patient's autonomy. So what do you do here? You will have no choice, but we can't retain patients against their will. We will have to bow down to their autonomous right to go home, but we will send them home. This is where I said that we need to damage, go for damage limitation and compromise solutions. So we tried those uh, compromise solutions and, uh, and damage control. So we offered him the opinion. Yeah, we'll be offered to get the nephrologist into the ward, speak to him and tell him about the illness because he just doesn't believe that he has a serious kidney problem. So the patient, so that was the compromise that we, uh, we, we tried to offer him. The patient is in a hospital. Then he said, you know, I have heard of a kidney doctor in Colombo and he would like to go to Colombo and meet this kidney doctor and get his opinion. And now, we know that it is perilous to send him to Colombo in that stage. And he said, I'll come back if the Colombo nephrologist says that the dialysis is needed. Again, ethical issues are patient's autonomy versus we know that sending him to Colombo is going to cause harm, may cause harm, non maleficence. And of course, beneficence is also being violated. So, what did we do? We kind of, you know, gave, we, we got him to give, take an appointment with the Colombo nephrologist at four o'clock or whatever. We informed the nephrologist that this patient would be coming to Colombo uh, to see the Colombo patient. And then, of course, we gave we gave a frucimide injection a couple of hours before and sent the family, with the family, send the patient to Colombo to see the nephrologist. So, I mean, we know that it's not ideal. It's, you know, Colombo nephrologist is going to say the same thing. We know that. But we respected the patient's autonomy, but we managed to come up with a compromise solution and reduce damage. So that's what I want you all to mention in exams as well. That is, 
the thing that we need to do at board level as well. Uh, one clinical scenario based on justice. Uh, now, in the height of the COVID epidemic, you know, pre-vaccine area, everybody who tested positive, whether they liked it or not, was sent to mandatory quarantine. Uh, you know, we know that patients, you remember that scene where in, I think, Valisar or someplace, some drug addicts were, you know, dragged from trees by the Navy and then uh, put into buses and sent to quarantine center and the Navy itself had an outbreak of COVID at that time. And also all those mask mandates, you know, where we were, uh, we were unhappy with anybody who was not wearing, you know, Wilson Karu, the actor was arrested by the police for not wearing a mask in a queue to collect the 5,000 rupees. So that's all justice. For the benefit of the society, individual be, be forced to do things against, against their, their will. Now, though I am uh, generally against justice and I'm all uh, kind of a you know, Kantian person, all for autonomy, beneficence, non maleficence I confess, at that time, I was happy that everybody was being forced to wear masks because I felt that that is the way to protect the society and individuals' rights had to be compromised at that time. So, you know, we have our principles and at times we, have, we are flexible with our own principles. But I, I want to highlight that and say, you know, that is one instance where all of us, I think just about every world, but all of us gave about all this patient autonomy. We, we, we kicked it aside and we agreed with the justice phenomenon, right? Okay. And I think this is the final scenario. Uh, now, again, I there was the... Again, these are all real life scenarios, things which happened to me in the past couple of days. So I want you all to be aware of when, when you're doing board rounds, when you're teaching, when you're learning, please be aware of all these dilemmas which come from which you have to face. You know, these things are part of your everyday life. So I, when I was preparing for the lecture, I just thought about what I had seen over the past, seen or heard over the past couple of days. And you know, everybody, all of you will have the same things that I'm facing. A patient with a past history of ulcerative colitis is seen by the gastroenterologist with a complaint of lack of energy and feeling as well. Previously under a GI surgeon, a patient had been under a GI surgeon who had treated ulcerative colitis for a few years and stopped treatment, saying ulcerative colitis was cured. The gastroenterologist does a colonoscopy and detects ongoing ulcerative colitis with a possible malignant polyp in the colon. Now, what does the under the professional etiquette. Now, this is not real medical ethics as such. Medical ethics has, is to do with doctors, patients, doctors and other medical professionals dealing with patients. That's medical ethics. This is more professional ethics or professional etiquette. Does he mention that the previous doctor's decision to stop treatment was incorrect? Well, we don't usually do that. We just stick to what, you know, what we have to do. Okay, the gastroenterologist is a nice guy. He just looked at all the reports and the colonoscopy and then he said, you know, you have this illness uh, and then you take this treatment and go on. So we try in the professional etiquette not to criticize our colleagues. Of course, people do criticize colleagues for different purposes, but we should try our level best never to criticize professional colleagues. You know, stick to what you are supposed to do. Don't comment on other people. Look at the patient in front of you. Do what needs to be done. The complication arises. What if the patient says, previous doctor said ulcerative colitis was cured. Now you say it's still on. Did the previous doctor get it wrong? Now, that is a tricky one because here you have to say something. You, you, you need to make a commitment. Do you kind of, you know, shape up the professional colleague or do you tell the patient the truth? In this instance, you must always remember your primary ethical duties towards the patient. And if the patient asks a question, you must give a truthful answer. And even if it has to come at the expense of uh, the reputation of a professional colleague, you need to tell the patient, yes, I think that decision was probably wrong. But then, of course, you must be very fair to your colleague and say, you know, I am making that judgment in hindsight. I am now seeing you having this illness, so it's easy for me to comment on that. But at that time, I don't know, because I didn't see what he saw. He may have had his own reasons for stopping, but all I can tell you is, now you have this illness, and it is possible uh, that had you continued the treatment, that this situation may not have arisen here. So you must remember that 
your duty is towards the patient, always to the patient. You must be truthful to the patient, but you must be reasonable and fair to your colleague because at the end of the day, our community has to go on. I'm not suggesting that you lie to patients to shape up your colleagues. I'm not suggesting that at all, but be fair and mindful about your colleague as well because there is a beautiful saying from Greek philosophy which says, what is good for the hive is good for the bee. You know, what is good for the bee is good for the bee massa kind of thing. So what is good for the profession will be good for us individually as well. So we must get out of the practice of harming colleagues with narrow objectives in mind. It may be professional jealousy, it might be increasing private practice, I don't know. But we must be fair to our professional colleagues as well. Right, uh, the final slide. There are a few important documents I would like you all to think about and look up if you all have time, if I have any interest in ethics. There's the Nuremberg Code. Uh, Nuremberg is a town in Germany where the trial of the Nazis, German Nazis was held around about 1946-47 when the Second World War was over. And there were many doctors also on trial for carrying out unethical research on uh, detainees, uh, detainees in, in, in Nazi concentration camps like Auschwitz. Uh, you know, they did some a lot of research and then actually found some very useful medical information also, but in terrible ways. Uh, for instance, most of the knowledge that we have on management of hypothermia comes from those uh, concentration camp trials, uh, research. You know, they used to just take the prisoners and dump them in freezing cold uh, water, keep them, and then uh, keep them for hours and see, you know, whether they would die, how long they can survive, and then take them out and try different ways of rewarming them to see which would be better. And one of the ways of rewarming was they used to dump them in boiling water and see, you know, what will happen to the patient. So some of those uh, findings are, have been, have a lot of medical validity, but they were, uh, they were obtained with heinous methods. So Nuremberg code came out after the trials about how to conduct research without harming human beings. Then there's something called the Helsinki Declaration, which came from the World Medical Association in 1964. Again, looking at recent uh, research ethics, now with, there is the Seventh Amendment to the Helsinki Declaration. There is, I think it came about 2013, the last amendment came. So that document is also there. So anybody who wants has an interest in research ethics should look at those. Then there's the Belmont Report, which I referred to earlier, which came from as an offshoot of the Tuskegee research uh, debacle that lays down three principles, uh, autonomy, beneficence, and justice, but in terms of uh, research projects. Then of course, this wonderful book of principle of biomedical ethics, which really crystallized the four principles for use even by clinicians like you and I, researchers and clinicians, everybody. The four principles came from this book. That is also a wonderful book. It's still being published by editions. I believe both these uh, professors are still alive and uh, that's great. So that's another important document. Then I think in my personal opinion, the best journal if you want to look up is the Journal of Medical Ethics, which is a BMJ journal, uh, which is a wonderful journal. Uh, I personally subscribe to that as well. That discusses very current topics, very current topics, uh, which is of interest to you all. Uh, there was a brilliant debate a couple of years ago on whether commercial sale of kidneys in should be permitted or not. You know, that's something which is very topical here. The ethics of it, there, were, there was a debate and both sides had strong arguments. Then of course, the last article is, doesn't rank alongside the other ones, but for anybody interested uh, look, to looking at what professionalism is, what medical ethics is, and what good medical practice is, how do they complement each other? How do you differ from each other? Uh, I, along with, um, uh, Dr. Harshini Raja, Professor Harshini Rajapaksa and Dr. Mihiran uh, wrote an article and published in the first edition of the first uh, first edition of the Asian Journal of Internal Medicine in 2022. That article is in public domain. It may be worthwhile for somebody to read and just have a look. Right. Uh, 
one final sentence i want to tell you is i have spent a lot of time telling you how to pass the communication skills and how to pass the ethical scenario at maybe mbbs maybe md maybe a pass degree but what i want to tell you is have no gap between your clinical practice and what you do in exams your training for exams should be the training for clinical practice what you are doing in the exam should be what you do in the ward there is no difference you must not do these things for exams and forget about it and do other things in the wards so minimize have no gap between the communication skills and ethical practice in your clinical practice and what you do in exam so that's my final plea primarily I, i truly apologize if i took too much time i thought i i thought i discussed only what was relevant uh, if there is anybody has any question i'll be happy to answer that i hope this has been a useful exercise if you have seen this like there were 120 participants 105 were still waiting All right. And okay. Q and you can see that Q and shall I read it? Then yes, please. Answer. If you can. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, sir. How many concerns we have to ask? Just one. So keep uh -huh. on asking till they no, say no, no more concerns. Thank you. Uh, good question. Uh, and uh, Premali, I think you can also help me answer. We usually teach two concerns to the uh, one or two concerns maximum to the can uh, to the surrogate because we are dealing with a 10 minute or 20 minutes uh, communication skill scenario we don't have endless concerns so if you address about two concerns that should be fine premal you agree yes yeah yeah not really more than two ne we can we don't have time for that but in the ward yes all concerns in the ward all concerns <laughs> Okay. Second, second question. question, sir. How to approach to an angry patient or a relation, especially in exam purpose? Okay. Right. Uh, that that's I I forgot actually to write that as possible scenario. We don't usually do that because surrogate has to be a very good actor to become angry. But we can do that. So when they are angry, they are usually angry about a mistake. The principles are: you acknowledge that there is a mistake. Number one, and you acknowledge that there is a mistake number one and you apologize saying i am we are sorry about this we are sorry not i am sorry but we are sorry because you work as a team we are sorry about this that's second principle third principle what you don't do is fix the blame on somebody you say no no it was not me but it was a microbiologist who suggested the wrong antibiotic or something like that you don't fix the blame on anyone you take it as a team so you say acknowledge that there has been a mistake you apologize profusely and surrogates have been trained you know after you apologize about twice to calm down and third thing is you say that you will create you will try to uh, to obtain uh, an appointment with a senior colleague maybe the consultant to discuss any further matters that's number 3 and number 4 you have you can say that you know you have already had a discussion within the team or you're going to have a discussion with the team which is going to look at ways not for this to happen again right so those are the four things one is you acknowledge that there has been a mistake yes there has been a mistake two i am sorry about not i am but we are sorry about the pain that has been caused to you the the discomfort that has been caused to you. we are really sorry about that and third thing is we i will create try to get an opportunity if you wish to speak to somebody senior that be maybe the consultant to get any further details that you want number 4 we have already had a meeting or we are going to have a meeting to come up with a mechanism to ensure that this mistake is not repeated again so those are the four principles that you do what you don't do is fix the blame on something to say no no it was the zero senior registrar who did it or you know it was a consultant who told me so i did it no, you don't fix blame on anyone okay premal if you want yeah. to add something to that i'll be uh, happy no, think, no that is it i think can the, there are two people actually thank you like uh, one said it was very important very important interesting presentation i believe that most of us need to learn a lot more on this topic thank you sir there's another somebody from mo psychiatry from bavonia she has who has written her name also thank you very much sir it was very informative those are the questions um okay and uh, we have, i think it's almost uh, 
spend the one and a half, one hour and 30 minutes. So I think uh, because they have enough uh, chances to write the chat box and all, we have answered the questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, they are free to contact me. I mean, yeah. at any time that if you want. I mean. Yes. And uh, just to tell Professor Arosha, you fulfill my task like in this session, like you have told, uh, like it, it was a fascinating talk. And uh, you did like in the way, the way which I want actually explain about this exam scenario, which everyone is interested, then you come back to the bedside, actually how we practice, that was really fascinating. And I also learn a lot. And it was really interesting talk. You know, usual ethics are very boring, but this is very interesting. It's uh, no one will believe this 120 people were waiting for this whole, uh, this you be this the highest uh, attendees for the SR forum. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy that that. Yeah, is, is thank you very there. much for uh, your time and the, your knowledge and everything. And I have few people to thank, Mr. Dishan Fernando, always helping us and uh, uh, giving this platform and our IT facilities, and uh, Gates Pharma for sponsoring this, and Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine President and the Council for uh, permitting this. Uh, thank you very much. Have a very good night. Thank you very much, Dr. Arosh again. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. Good night to all of you. Take good care of yourself. Okay. Bye.